We've been studying Ephesians chapters 1 and 2. We've been talking about spiritual riches, all the benefits <clears throat> that we have in Jesus because of our redemption. And we've learned about mercy and grace and peace. We've learned about reconciliation and redemption. Chapter 2 tells us that God has brought us to life. And then we Gentiles who used to be outsiders are now brought inside the family and we are, are welcomed into the family and the kingdom of God. And we come to a, a four-verse passage here as we finish chapter 2 that brings us to the attention of the local church. I love the local church. The local church was God's idea. Jesus Christ died to establish it. He purchased it with His own blood, Acts 20 says. And I love the church. Now, no church is perfect. Every church is a work in progress because it's made up of people like us, right? Uh, we have things we're always working on. We're trying to improve this or that. We have parking issues as a church. We have space issues with our children's ministry, and uh, we, have, uh, we have thermostat programming issues the last couple weeks. We've been, I think we're doing better today on that. But uh, there's always little things we want to improve. Sometimes churches struggle with their printed material, with typos and with the bulletin being correct. Uh, I read some of these errors that occurred in church bulletins, and sometimes it's not a typo. Sometimes it's just the wording that the person who wrote the article chose to use is not clear about the meaning. For example, one church bulletin said, attention ladies, join us for Saturday's rummage sale. This is a great opportunity to get rid of unwanted items just lying around your house. Be sure to bring your husband. <coughs> a, d a different church bulletin said, a new loudspeaker system has been installed in the church. It was given by one of our members in honor of his wife. <clears throat> the Weight Watchers group will meet at 7 p.m. Please use the large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> That's terrible. The church maintenance man wrote a, a note uh, and put it on the church secretary's desk, and, and the note said, Van Battery Dead. So the bulletin the next week, as they opened it, read, Please pray for the family of Van Battery who died this week. Um, they wanted to type the word singing, but they accidentally typed the word sinning because of autocorrect. And so the article said, anyone who enjoys sinning is invited to join our choir. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of our choir. Uh, <coughs> my favorite one is... Um, the, the, a mission, this is a true story. The missionary was, have, was coming to visit like we have missionaries visit, and the missionary's name was, was Bertha Belch. Now, that's a rough last name to have, especially in junior high probably, but her name was Bertha Belch, and she had faithfully served as a missionary in Africa for many years, and she was coming to report to the church uh, uh, as to how the mission was going. And so the bulletin article advertised the fact that the missionary uh, would be there in the services next Sunday, and it said, come here, Bertha Belch, all the way from Africa. Um, <laughs> so, um, definitely not what you want to communicate. Our bulletin person does a very good job. Uh, Jessica does, does a fantastic job with ours. Uh, we haven't had any of those errors. But as I thought about our church, and, and every week I think about the many things I'm thankful for about our church, and I also sometimes think about the things we need to correct or improve or tweak or adjust or accommodate for and things we're sometimes behind on or I'm behind on. I was thinking about this passage, and I was thinking about what God says about a church, because more important than parking lots and bulletin articles is the biblical description that we see in Scripture for what a church is and who a church is supposed to be. Because there are some things that are, that are important, but then there are some things that are vital and critical and are core to who we are and what God has called us to be. And that's really what we're finding out when we come to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. We have just read, and we studied this two weeks ago, we have read that, that we Gentiles and the Jews have come together in a new family, the family of God, in a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And then that thought continues, 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, that speaks of the kingdom, and of the household of God, that speaks of the family, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. These verses tell us that not only are we a kingdom, not only are we a family, but we are a house. We are a house that God is building. These metaphors matter. These metaphors show us who God's made us, and it helps us to understand who we are. By the way, our identity corporately as a church is an important part of who we are. It's a defining way that God speaks of us in the New Testament. We live in an overly individualistic society. All of the focus in the marketing and in our society is on individualism and on your uniqueness and independence as an individual. But the Scriptures, the New Testament emphasizes our identity together and our, our corporate identity as a family, a spiritual family, as a kingdom, God's kingdom, as a flock, and in these verses, as a house that God is building that's connected to one another, being put together by Him. We've been part of His family, but we're not just His household, verse 19. We are also His house, verses 20 through 22. Most of you have seen a house get constructed from the ground up, either your own house or maybe <clears throat> a project that you worked on or maybe a house in your neighborhood got built, <clears throat> and you watched uh, the excavation and the foundation and then the framing construction and then getting it enclosed and installing the roof and putting the finishes in, and then finally one day somebody moved in. Most of you have watched that. Back in 2005, Nicole and I bought uh, a one-acre patch of raw, undeveloped desert in Southern California, and then we undertook the the major project of building a home there. <clears throat> and um, it was a fun experience. It was a demanding and stressful experience on many occasions. It was a complicated process. It cost more than we ever expected it to, and it took longer than we intended. And if you've ever done anything like that, you know exactly how that works. <clears throat> but it was rewarding <clears throat> because for 10 years we lived there. <clears throat> we brought uh, two children home from the hospital and from the adoption courts into that, that home and enjoyed that with the six of us as a family for 10 years until uh, the Lord called us to, to leave that and come to Howell, Michigan. It was a great blessing. And you know, as we, as we lived in that house and enjoyed that house for those 10 years, I often looked around and saw things I wished we'd done differently. There were rooms that I wished were larger or smaller, or things we installed that I wished we'd have chosen differently and done differently. But, you know, I was thinking about that. The best, of, the best of the homes we live in or the best of the buildings that we construct are just constructed by imperfect people. But God, God is the master builder. God is a builder with a level of wisdom and a level of uh, goodness and a level of beauty that none of us could ever imagine. In fact, uh, Hebrews 10, 11 says, there is a city being prepared for us whose builder and maker is God. Did you know that God is a builder? And He's building heaven. But He's also building something on earth, and that is the church. He is building the church with us. You and I are the raw materials that He's using, these verses tell us, to build His church, to build this house for Himself. 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul says the reason he's writing Timothy is so that he will know how that the Christians should behave themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Jesus said, I will build my church. And so as God builds his church, of which we are a part, what should we know about it? According to Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Well, I see three distinct lessons 
as we consider the house. First of all, in verse 20, we see the foundation of the house. Here we read that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, we have a lot of construction experts in our church. We have numbers of licensed builders and contractors in our church, and they're gifted. And, and, and one of the things they'll tell you is, if the foundation under the surface isn't right, it doesn't matter what quality materials or craftsmanship is used above the surface, because, if, because everything else depends on the foundation. And here in this verse, we learn that the foundation is what provides the church its stability and its longevity. Uh, there are two components to the foundation. The first thing that's mentioned is the apostles and the prophets. Now think about Ephesians 4, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, verse 19 and 20, and think about the time it was written. The New Testament did not yet exist. The New Testament was in the process of being written by people like Paul. And there may have been some of the books completed of our 27 books, but, but you had the apostles, those 11 who were around Jesus, and then Paul really became the 12th to replace Ju Judas. These apostles spoke, and they spoke the doctrines of the faith. And if you study the New Testament, you learn that there was a very intentional passionate attention given to the apostles transferring the doctrine carefully to every new believer and the next generation of Christians. And it was a very important process, a process that they were passionate about. You know, the modern church, I think, needs a reminder of the vital nature of Bible doctrine and the importance and the vital nature, the foundational nature of what we believe and the rich depth. I, I think some people today are looking for an inspirational story or a motivational seminar, but they don't have a lot of time or attention or, or, or interest in the, the depth of doctrine that is in the pages and the words of Scripture. And if there's one thing I want to describe our church, it is that we are a church that is serious about the doctrines of our faith. We know what we believe. We know why we believe it. We know where to find it in the Word, and we know how to explain it to someone else. Jude 3 says that the faith <clears throat> was once delivered to the saints. There was this package of doctrine delivered in the first century from Jesus <clears throat> and through the apostles to the early church. And here's what the 21st century Christians need to be reminded of. That faith, that foundation that was delivered to us doesn't need to be updated. There is no 2.0 version necessary. The, the faith that we were given is to be contended for, Jude 3, not adjusted for culture or for the winds of what's fashionable or for what we are told is acceptable. The doctrine is unchanging and the doctrine is foundational. It is the power and the fuel for us as a church. If we don't have that doctrine, if we don't have the truths of Scripture committed in our hearts and embedded in our, in our souls, we don't have anything as a church. We aren't a church because we don't have a foundation if we don't have the doctrine. The most important thing about a church is what it believes, the doctrines of the faith. In 1 Timothy, Paul wrote, uh, the young Timothy who was later the pastor of this Ephesian church, at the time of the writing of the letter. And he was told, Till I come, give attention to doctrine, 1 Timothy 4.13. And in verse 16, Take heed to thyself and to the doctrine. How important is the doctrine? He says in verse 16, Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Your soul and the soul of the people you preach to depends on your passionate attention to to doctrine. Doctrine matters because it's what we believe. And one of the things that's true about our church is we're going to give great attention to that. I, I see it as a big trust that's given to me and to the others who occupy the pulpit of this church, and I am grateful. We heard Pastor John preach last Wednesday. We heard Pastor Nathan preach last Sunday. 
We heard Pat, uh, Chris Maven preach a few weeks ago, and we'll have other guest speakers occasionally. And one of the things that's very important to us is the fact that there's a responsibility to unpack the Scriptures, to give understanding of the Scriptures, and to have correct doctrine invested in the hearts of God's people. And I want to challenge you as a church to be your own student of Scripture as well. Uh, and I know there's some people in our church who could study circles around me in the Word because they've been giving passionate attention to it as, as a believer over the years, and I just want to challenge you, that's for everybody. I know some of us probably have academics and, and, and book smarts come more naturally than others, but I think all of us ought to be passionately pursuing a depth of understanding for Scripture so that if you need to explain why you believe what you believe to your children, you can. So that if you need to share the gospel with your neighbor, you can. So that if you need to explain to a friend at work who thinks maybe all the religions are about the same, why? Jesus Christ is unique and the only way to God, you can find it in the pages of Scripture. I hope this fall to announce some, some classes and some studies and some groups that are specifically designed to help deepen the doctrinal depth of our church family. And I hope you'll have a passion for that personally and engage in our church in that, in that regard. There is plenty of room in our church for flexibility and variety in other areas. For example, We've done a lot of renovating in our church. And sometimes someone says, well, I like that paint color, or I didn't like that paint color, or I like that carpet, or I didn't like that carpet, or whatever. There's, there's lots of room for variety in those areas. There, there's, there's room for variety in what time our services meet. What, what is our schedule going to be? And are we going to have two services or three? Or are we going to have one? Or are we going to meet in this building? Or are we going to meet outside? Uh, there, there's, there's plenty of room for variety as to the music selection or as to what curriculum we're going, to, we're going to teach in the children's ministry. But the one thing that is inflexible, the one thing that there is no negotiating about, is the doctrine that is contained on the words of the pages of Scripture. Because it's our foundation. And it says here that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of this foundation. Now, of all the stones that would make up the foundation of an ancient structure, the cornerstone was the most important. It was the first stone that was put into place. And every stone heading to the left, every, head, every stone heading to the right, every stone heading up from that stone depended on and received guidance from and was squared to the cornerstone. If you didn't have a square cornerstone, you didn't have a square building. If you didn't have a solid cornerstone, you didn't have a stable building. And Jesus Christ is the perfect cornerstone for the church. Everything else hinges and depends on Him. That's why I think it's a beautiful and an important thing that from the very opening moments of our service, our attention is on Him. What is the first song that we were led in this morning? Jesus what a mighty name. What an important thing to start the service focused on Jesus Christ and have Jesus Christ be the theme of the service all throughout it and at the end to finish in His name focused on Him because He is the cornerstone. Repeatedly in Scripture, Jesus is called the cornerstone. There was a prophecy in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, Isaiah said in chapter 28, verse 16, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. This was a specific prophecy referring to the coming Messiah who Jesus fulfilled. In fact, Jesus claimed that he fulfilled that prophecy. The Pharisees were questioning him on one day and if, in Matthew chapter 21, and Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures? That the stone which the builders rejected that same is become the head of the corner. Uh, he's referring to Psalm 118, quoting there, that there. As he says, he is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of being the cornerstone that God would, would send. And, and the builders, the, the Jewish leaders, might reject the cornerstone, but that doesn't make a difference. God will place him at the corner of this building that he is building, which we now know is the church. 1 Peter 2.7 the Apostle Peter says, Unto you who believe He, Jesus, is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made 
the head of the corner. Of all the doctrines that are vital to us, the most foundational one is the doctrine of Jesus Christ, who He was, what He did, His virgin birth, His literal resurrection, His soon coming, Jesus Christ, His sinless nature, His deity. It might be tempting for a church to try to build itself in these modern days on some other foundation. Some churches might try to build themselves on the foundation of a gifted musician team. Another church might try to build itself on the foundation of an effective marketing strategy. Another church might try to build itself on the foundation of a winsome pastor, maybe a, someone with charisma and charm and communication skills. You're thinking, there's no risk of that here. Uh, some other church <clears throat> might try to build itself on the foundation of a, a, a slick online presentation or having the greatest wow factor in their children's ministry. But I will tell you, none of those foundations will, will enable a church to be what God's called it to be. Only the foundation of Jesus Christ and the truths of His Word are an enduring, eternal foundation on which the church of Jesus Christ must be built. That's the foundation of the house. When we come to verse 21, we learn about the structure of the house. It says here in verse 21 that God is building something that is fitly framed together. The framing of the structure of a building is one of the most exciting parts of construction. And one of the reasons I love it is because if it takes six months to build something, let's say there's a groundbreaking ceremony and the excavation starts, and then six months later there's a ribbon-cutting ceremony and uh, the family moves into the new home that they, they've now got an occupancy permit for, or the, the church occupies a building that it's built maybe, or, or a business, that six-month period is a long, arduous construction process. But the framing of the building, of the structure, that just takes a few weeks of that six months. And that's the few weeks where you see the building take shape. I love framing for a lot of reasons. I love the fact that it sort of like rises up from the ground out of nothing, and, and now here's this structure here. I also like framing better than finished carpentry, Ryan, because you don't have to be as precise. When Ryan builds finished carpentry products, he has to get right down to the 64th of an inch. Everything has to be fit together just perfectly for that piece of furniture or cabinetry or trim. But with framing, Matt, it's like, eh, it's close enough. We're going to cover it in drywall anyway, right? Uh, you know, uh, these verses make me envision the idea, as I've seen so many homes or church buildings be framed in the past with lumber or metal or steel, it makes me envision the idea that God has all these building materials and He's bringing each of these pieces of materials together to build a beautiful, Ephesians 5, glorious church. And we are the building materials. He's using us, fitting us together, joining us together in one unified structure a structure that none of us could be on our own without each other and without God, the master builder's hands, involved in placing us together. Peter uh, writes a similar concept. Instead of using the analogy of framing, Peter uses the analogy of a stone building, a, a, a mason putting a stone building together. He says in 1 Peter 2.5, you as lively stones are built up in a spiritual house. And Peter is painting basically the same picture. He's saying that, that God is taking each of you believers and he's placing you as a, as a master mason would, in, piecing you together into this structure. This, these words in verse 21 fitly framed together or joined, fitted together, refers to the careful joining of every component of a piece of furniture, a wall, a building, or another structure. Every part is precisely cut to fit snugly, strongly, and beautifully with every other part. Nothing is out of place, defective, misshapen, or inappropriate. And I know how you sometimes feel about yourself and how I sometimes feel about myself. We think to ourselves, 
what do I have to offer to the church? Why would, why would God want me to be a part of this building He's building? I'm of no use. I'm, I'm the misfit piece of extra equipment that when you put everything together, I'm the part that's left over that nobody knows what to do with. It doesn't fit in. But, but according to the meaning of these words and according to the text of this Scripture, there are no spare parts in the building God is building. My second job was at Tecumseh Plywood working in the lumberyard. My third job was at Moore's Lumberyard in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so in both of those lumberyards, occasionally the foreman of the yard would say to me, the grunt laborer, it's time to call this particular dimension of lumber. Uh, it might be that the, the eight foot two by fours need to be called, C U L L E D, call. That means you take out the pieces that are no good and you keep the pieces that are good that the builders want to purchase. I, by the way, this is just a good opportunity in case anyone from Home Depot is watching. Would you please call your lumber occasionally? Um, I know, I know it's very valuable, but, uh, but when I go to Home Depot or Lowe's, I walk down the lumber aisle, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the dimension I need. Let's just say I need a 12-foot 2x6. I walk past every other piece of lumber, and the rack is full. Thousands of straight, square, beautiful boards. I get to the piece that I want. It looks like a Hot Wheels racetrack. It's going curved left and right and up and down. And there's like three of them there. That's how it is for me. But anyway... Here's my point. The lumberyard boss would say, these builders can't use this junk. Throw it out. We can burn it or we can cut it up and use it for blocks to set good lumber on, but we can't sell it to builders because it's no good for them. They don't want that. Throw, call the bad stuff out. Here's the point. When it comes to the church, if you've been born again, God knew what he was doing, and he put you here, and you're not a cold piece of lumber, you're not a useless piece of building material, you're not a spare part, he has a place for you to fit in, and you are as just as vital to the structure as some other piece. You show up to a building site, there's all kinds of different materials, right, when they frame the building. There's long and skinny pieces like 16-foot 2x4s, and there's flat, wide pieces like sheets of plywood. There's little tiny pieces that you can't even see with the naked eye from a distance, nails and screws. You say, well, I don't think those are very important. Try doing it without them. Try taking them all out in a moment from the structure. That thing is falling over. So the point is this. Some of us are two by four. Some of us are plywood. Some of us are nails and screws. You know, I think I know who that one screwy one is. But uh, we are all vital pieces who are placed here and connected here by God's wise, sovereign grace. And he makes no mistakes. We are different than each other. Now, here's what God does because God has a sense of humor. He puts somebody who prides themselves in being a long, skinny two-by-four, he connects them to a big, wide, flat sheet of plywood, very different than them, and he uses nails to do it. And so, in the church, God puts people together and then sometimes we go, why can't they be more like me? Or, I don't feel like we're, 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 we're jiving here. And the fact is, that's part of the beauty and that's part of the intentionalness of our God is to bring people with different gifts, with different strengths, with different weaknesses, with different burdens and needs, with different talents and skills, with different perspectives and personalities to be brought together into something that only he can fully envision. The two by four doesn't have the luxury of perspective that it would need to stand back at the road and look at the structure that it's a part of and see the beautiful thing that the builder is building. But the two by four needs to trust. You are the two by four if you're not following me here. Uh, the two by four needs to trust that it's a part of something that a wise master builder is piecing together in his wisdom and in his beauty. It's, it's common when, when, when someone drives past a job site of construction for them to look at it and say, that doesn't look right. Now, I'm talking about your average layman. Your average layman drives past a construction site and sees something under construction. They inevitably say, 
I don't think they're doing it right. Now, grant you, they have no engineering degree. They have no architecture degree. They've never built anything in their lives, and they're not licensed to build. But they know that it's probably being done wrong, okay? This will happen when we build our church building. Someone's going to drive by a year from now, and they're going to see a building under construction by God's grace, and they're going to say, I don't think they're doing it right. And, 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 and by the way, sometimes I'm a do-it-yourselfer. Sometimes at home, I'll do a project, and I'll, the demo is always fun. And, and you do all the demo, and then you start doing all the framing, and then the wife invariably walks in, not to offer you cold lemonade, not to say, can I hold the other end of the board while you cut it? She walks in to say, honey, that doesn't look right to me. <laughs> to which I reply, I'm trying to be a good Christian, get out of here. Uh, <laughs> because here's why. Sometimes when, when something's being built, only the architect and the builder know what the final product is really supposed to look like and how this ugly work in process reflects what's actually going to be finally completed and everyone will like. And I just think the church is like that. I think the church is like that. And when we, when we interact with each other and when we go through transitions and growing pains and when we have things we get right and things we don't get right, we need to trust the process, trust the master builder, Trust the plans. What are the plans? The pages of the New Testament. And trust that God has His hands on us and He's doing what He is gifted and skilled to do. I like the phraseology in verse 21. It says, as the building is fitly framed together, it grows unto a holy temple. Isn't that interesting? Paul says this building is growing. Why would he say that? Because every time a new believer comes into the faith, God is adding a piece of material to what he is building, and he isn't done until the last person is to be saved. What a beautiful truth in Scripture. This all reminds me, of course, of 1 Corinthians 12, which says in another metaphor that God brings into the body, into the family, into the building, each member as he sees fit. God knows what he's doing. So we see in verse 20, the foundation of the house. In verse 21, the structure of the house. What do we see in verses 21 and 22? Well, we see the most important thing about the house there. When we built that house back in 2005, for the next 10 years, the most important thing to me wasn't the paint color we chose, the cabinet finish we chose or the flooring materials we chose? What was the most important thing to me as the owner of the house? The people who lived there. That was the most important thing to me. That's the most important thing about your house, the people who live there. The most important thing about the church is the occupant of the house because these verses say that God is the occupant of this house He's building. This is growing to a holy temple for God. We are being built together, verse 22, as an habitation of God through His Spirit. God's Spirit is here. And the most important thing about Bible Baptist Church or any biblical church is the God who inhabits that church by His Spirit. I heard the story of a cowboy who went to church he knew he, he needed to go to church, and he had been gone for too long, and so he picked the church in his farming community, and he went. Now, he didn't have any dress clothes. He had, uh, he had some boots. He didn't have any polish for them, but he, he cleaned them up as good as he could. <clears throat> he got his cleanest pair of jeans, his cleanest shirt, his cleanest hat, and his best belt buckle, and he went to church on Sunday. Now, he immediately... Uh, perceived as he arrived at church that this was a more sophisticated church than he was going to fit into very well. Everyone was dressed to the nines, and he got a lot of condescending looks from the people that were real formal, and uh, some of them even scooted away from him in the pew where he was seated, and no one spoke to him until afterwards. And the pastor spoke to him in sort of a pious, condescending tone, and the pastor said, sir, I want you to come back next week, but before next week, I want you to pray, and I want you to ask God what you should, how you should dress for this church service. And he said, okay, I will. 
And so the cowboy left, and he prayed. And the next week he came back. Same boots, same jeans, same shirt, same belt buckle, same hat. The pastor was the first one to greet the man, the only one to greet the man. And he said, sir, I thought you were going to pray and ask God what he thought you should wear to this church. And he said, I did. He said, well, what did God say? He said, well, uh, he said he didn't know what I should wear because he's never been here before. I want to be a church where God's spirit is welcomed. I want to be a church where God is in the middle of it and no one has any question about whether he is here. As we sing his praises, as we open his word, as we repent of sin, as we seek to be obedient, I want to be a church that leans into this fact that we are built together, verse 22, as a habitation of our great God. You know, God has always desired to be with His people. He walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He planted His presence in the tabernacle that Moses constructed and later in the temple that Solomon constructed. One day, Revelation 21.3 says that the tabernacle of God will dwell with men and He will dwell with them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God, Revelation 21, 3. But what about now? There's no temple. There's no tabernacle. What about now? Well, 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says that you and I have the Holy Spirit within us. What? Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you and in me. And that's a wonderful truth. But this verse takes that truth to an even additional level. This verse tells us, as well as other verses, that when the church gathers together, when individuals like you and me gather together, each with the Holy Spirit within us, God is uniquely in our midst, and we together are His unique, distinct dwelling place. 2 Corinthians 6.16, you, in the plural sense, ye are are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I pray that when we come together, we will be aware of the presence of God. We will, we will keep our ears tuned to the voice of God. We will have our hearts purified and right with God so that when we come to church, we're not looking around at each other. We're not having our mind a million miles away outside the walls of this building, but when we come into this house and when we gather and assemble together, we are in God's presence and we experience His presence. It's not about us. It's not about the people on stage. It's about Him. It's about our focus on Him. And I would encourage you as a church, do everything you can to come into this house of worship every Sunday eager and ready and prepared to lean into the fact that God's Spirit is here and He will meet with us. And it is a great privilege that the God who created us and the God who redeemed us would meet with us in this place as we gather together. Now, the building isn't special, but the building is important because it houses the people in whose souls the Spirit dwells and when they gather where He dwells. So I would encourage you, when you come in each Sunday, Come in prayed up. Don't sleep till the last minute and then knock your alarm off the uh, nightstand and then come dragging in here, your car screeching around the corner on two wheels, fighting with your family, you know, slamming into your spot and running in here at the last second with a thousand other things on your mind. No. Go to bed early on Saturday night. Don't waste your time staying and watching foolish things on television late at night. Uh, Pray for your pastor. Pray for your worship team. Pray for your Sunday school teachers. Pray for the ministry that you're, maybe you're going to be a greeter or an usher or a children's teacher. Pray for the families of our church. Pray for the precious suffering individuals in our church. and, And then go to bed early and get up early and spend some time as the sun rises on Sunday morning asking God to bless the gathering of his people that you're, that you belong to. Come in here with your sin confessed and dealt with. Don't come in here with, with sin that, you're, that, you've got, that you've not dealt with. Come in with a, a tender and a humble heart. Come in with your, your Bible in your hand and praise on your lips and an eagerness to hear from God. Come in here 
right with your brothers and sisters in these seats. Nothing between you and your Savior, nothing between you and your siblings. Also, nothing between you and your family members. How many of us have gotten into some of our world-class fights on the way to church over the years? That's why our family drives separately, but uh, that's another story. We don't have enough parking spots for all of you to drive separately. We've got we to gotta be together and unified and on the same page. Why? Because we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We want to meet with the Holy Spirit. And we want to hear from the Holy Spirit. And as we open His words, we want to, by faith, understand that God is meeting with us. I'm as sure that He's here as I'm sure that I'm here. Because that's what His Word tells us. I hope these verses speak to your heart about the fact that you're part of something special. Church. There is no perfect church. There's a lot of things our church needs to do to improve this or that. But I will tell you, it's special. Because God's here. God's at work here. God brought you here. And He's building something here that's going to outlast our physical bodies for sure. And He's building something here that's important to Him. You could be a part of a lot of things in this world, a lot of clubs and societies and causes you could be a part of. There's nothing as vital and eternal and significant as being part of a biblical church with the apostles and their doctrine and Jesus Christ as our foundation and people that are different than us connected to us because God's grace and God's spirit led us here and God's presence is in our midst. May we be a church always defined by the unity and togetherness that's described here and by the presence and power and glory of the Holy Spirit that he's worthy of. I don't know what steps you need to take as a result of what you've heard today. Maybe there's a way you need to get involved and you need to say, okay, I need to get myself off the lumber pile and engaged into the building. Or maybe you say, um, there's some way that I could better contribute to the unity or to the, to the presence of God as we meet here on Sundays. Or maybe, uh, maybe you'd say, you know, I don't think I've ever begun my relationship with Christ. If you're new to all this and you've never entered a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that's the first step. That's what these two chapters have been about, Ephesians 1 and 2, the last 10 weeks. It's been about God bringing you to life spiritually and, and reconciling you to Himself and, and, and making you who were once His enemy through sin, His friend and His child accepted into His family. If you've never entered His family through the new birth by receiving Christ as your Savior, when we pray in just a moment, you could pray and receive Christ. Or if you have questions about it, you could see me afterwards or someone else afterwards. Or you could write us a note on the card or send us a message. But there's nothing more important than being part of the family and then being a fully engaged piece of the building. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you for redemption and for the beautiful wisdom that you have. And I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Lord, for leading me and my family to be connected to this house nearly six years ago. And for each of the people in this room, in your leadership in their lives, we see your wisdom in it. We see your goodness in it. And I pray that you'd help us to be a church that is always faithful to the doctrines of our faith, to the truths of your word, to the person of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray you'd help us to be a church that welcomes your presence and that spreads your grace and message and gospel. And I pray you protect our togetherness, make us unified, and most importantly, Fill us with your spirit for the work you've called us to do.